see them then. And I want to see them now. This is an NBC News special report. A presidential news conference. Reporting from New York, Jane Pauley. Good afternoon. President Clinton promised a couple of weeks ago that he would be holding more news conferences, and today he's making good on that promise. He is scheduled to come into the East Room of the White House in just a couple of minutes. We know that Cuba will be on his agenda. Andrea Mitchell is also standing by in the East Room of the White House. What else? Also the crime bill. The president is expected to give his bottom line on the crime bill, what he's going to accept from Hill negotiators, and he'll also talk about that new Cuba policy. Now, Jane, we have to go back to the president. Yeah, can you turn it up here? To escape their nation's internal problems. In so doing, it has risked the lives of thousands of Cubans and several have already died in their efforts to leave. This action is a cold-blooded attempt to maintain the Castro grip on Cuba and to divert attention from his failed communist policies. He is trying to export to the United States the political and economic crises he has created in Cuba in defiance of the democratic tide flowing throughout this region. Let me be clear. The Cuban government will not succeed in any attempt to dictate American immigration policy. The United States will do everything within its power to ensure that Cuban lives are saved and that the current outflow of refugees is stopped. Today, I have ordered that illegal refugees from Cuba will not be allowed to enter the United States. Refugees rescued at sea will be taken to our naval base at Guantanamo while we explore the possibility of other safe havens within the region. To enforce this policy, I have directed the Coast Guard to continue its expanded effort to stop any boat illegally attempting to bring Cubans to the United States. The United States will detain, investigate, and if necessary, prosecute Americans who take to the sea to pick up Cubans. Vessels used in such activities will be seized. I want to compliment the Coast Guard and the Immigration and Naturalization Service for their efforts. And I want to thank Florida's officials, including Governor Childs and the Florida Congressional Delegation, for their help in protecting and saving the lives of Cubans who seek to escape the regime. Now I'd like to speak just for a moment about the crime bill. In the last week, I have fought hard to put this crime bill back on track. After extensive talks with members of both parties, I have indicated my support for strengthening the provisions that require sexual predators to report to the police and make sure their communities are notified of their presence. And I support cutting overall spending in the bill by 10%. These cuts will ensure that every dollar authorized in the bill will actually be paid for, not with new taxes and not by diverting dollars from other needed programs, but as I have always insisted, with the savings we will gain from reducing the size of the federal government by over a quarter of a million people over the next six years to its lowest size in over 30 years since President Kennedy was here. And all these historic savings will go back to the American people to make their streets and their homes, their schools safer. I have insisted that we keep the most profoundly important elements of the crime bill. To keep it tough by putting 100,000 police officers on the street, building more prisons, putting violent criminals away for good, by making three strikes you're out, the law of the land, and by other stronger provisions on sentencing. And we're going to keep it smart with the sensible crime prevention programs that steer our kids away from drugs and gangs and give them things to say yes to. The crime bill must ban handguns for juveniles and take deadly assault weapons off our streets. 
even though we've come under intense pressure from forces that will apparently say anything to take the assault weapons out of the bill, I have refused to do so. Let's keep in mind what this crime bill is all about. It's about removing fear from our streets, our schools, and our home. Innocent Americans should not have to fear being preyed upon as so many do today. Innocent children should not have to fear losing their childhoods as so many do today. We owe it to the American people that do the work and pay the bills in this country to make sure that people who commit crimes get caught, that those who are guilty get convicted, and those who are convicted serve their time. We also owe it to them to do whatever we can to prevent crime in the first place. That's what the police and the prevention programs are all about. That's why it is so important and why I have worked so hard to make sure that we do not turn this crime issue into yet another Washington partisan issue. This is a grassroots, mainstream, nonpartisan issue, and so it should remain. It must be an American crime bill. We have worked hard on it, and I call upon Congress to pass it without delay. Helen. President, on behalf of all the press corps, we want to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And now... <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Uh... Well, you could all do a lot to make it happy. <laughs> that is not a guilt trip. Feel no pressure. Thank you. Mr. President, in the last 35 years, we've had an embargo against Cuba. What and increase the economic burden on the... I understand that's why the refugees are coming in. What is the problem with taking so, a few small, albeit brave, steps to negotiate a possible movement toward democracy with Cuba? We've dealt with many communist countries through the last 35 years, and we're dealing with them now. There aren't many left. I support the embargo, and I support the Cuba Democracy Act which was passed in 1992, and I do not believe we should change our policy there. The fundamental problem is democracy is sweeping the world. Democracy and freedom are sweeping our hemisphere. Uh, in the Caribbean alone and in Central and South America, in all of this region, there are only two countries now not democratically governed with open societies and open economies. The real problem is the stubborn refusal of the Castro regime to have an open democracy and an open economy, and I think the policies we are following will hasten the day when that occurs. And we follow those policies because we believe they are the ones most likely to promote democracy and ultimately prosperity for the people of Cuba. Isn't that true of, Cuba, of North Korea or China? And you're dealing with them every day. I think the circumstances are different, and I think our policy is correct. President, uh, recognizing that you're slowing down the process, do uh, people fleeing Cuba still get automatic entry to the United States as political refugees if they're not criminals or ill? No. You're ending this people, the, the people leaving Cuba will not be permitted to come to the United States. They will be sent to safe havens. The people, the, here. The people who reach here will be apprehended and will be treated like others. They will be their cases will be reviewed, and those who qualify can stay, and those who don't will not be permitted to. They will be now treated like others who come here. Brett. Under the law, uh, it has always been clear that Cuban refugees had a certain priority on staying here. The policy, of course, has been that anybody who got here got to stay. Uh, what restraints are you operating under in terms of the law and changing this policy? Well, and are you likely, sir, to be sued over this? No, the Cuban, uh, let me, uh, I'm glad you asked that question in contradistinction to the one you asked it right afterward. I, the Cuban Adjustment Act will continue to be the law of the land. But we are doing our best within that. We will, we will detain the Cubans who come here now. They will not simply be released into the population at large, and we will uh, review all their cases in light of the applicable law, including the Cuban Adjustment Act. How long that will take? How long those, uh, those Depends detainments? on how many there are, of course, and we don't know. Andrea? Can you give us some more details? Are these people going to be taken to Guantanamo, 
What kind of strain might this place on our naval forces, the Coast Guard? Already we're being told that drug interdiction is being cut back. And can you respond to criticism already from Bob Dole and Newt Gingrich? Uh, in particular, Mr. Gingrich said that your new policy is appalling. It's an example of mixed morality and that uh, he thinks it is illegal under the act. Well, first let me answer the factual questions. The, the refugees, uh, those who are fleeing, will be taken first to Guantanamo, where we will seek safe havens for them. That is plainly not uh, illegal uh, under international law, nor do we believe it is illegal under the Cuban Adjustment Act. Secondly, uh, as to whether it is immoral, I just would say it is my belief that the American people and that the Cuban-American people and the people of Florida, but the people of the entire United States, do not want to see another Mariel boat lift. They do not want to see Cuba dictate our immigration policy. They do not want to see Mr. Castro able to export his political and economic problems to the United States. Now that is what is plainly being set up. We have gone through that once. We had 120,000 people sent to this country as a deliberate attempt, not because they themselves initially wanted to flee, they were encouraged to flee, they were pushed out. We had jails open, we had mental hospitals open, all in an attempt to export all the problems of Cuba to the United States. We tried it that way once. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now, and I'm not going to let it happen again. Yeah. Do, can you respond to the rest of the question? The, the, uh, yeah, that's my answer to them. No, what, what about the, um, the naval forces, the Coast Guard? Oh, Are they up to this? We, Will it... I think the Coast Guard is plainly up to it. We may have to have a little more Navy support. Uh, I met with the Secretary of Defense this morning. We discussed it at length. He is confident that we can do what we have to do without undermining our fundamental mission. You said that the crime bill was something that you supported, that you wanted to sign as a vote. Well. Now you're saying you can take 10 percent out of it. Why should the American people believe that there's still a lot of fat that can come out of it? First of all, any time you start a, a, I've never seen a bill that started new programs that you couldn't cut some and maintain its fundamental integrity. I said that crime bill was a strong and good bill as it was, and it was a strong and good bill. But one of the things that happened in conference that is, I think has been largely overlooked is that in an attempt to get as much money as possible for police officers and law enforcement and for prisons and for border patrol, funds were appropriated or were authorized in the crime bill that came out of conference in an amount greater than we could provide in the trust fund. Keep in mind that the great beauty of this crime bill is it's the first major program in American history that's being financed entirely by reducing the size of the federal bureaucracy and taking all the savings from the federal government and putting it in a trust fund to help grassroots Americans get better control over their own lives. The practical impact of what we are doing by cutting 10 percent of this will be to be able to put everything that's left into the trust fund. So in terms of real dollars, I believe there will be more money actually appropriated and spent for tough law enforcement and for police officers. And I believe that all the fundamental important things in the prevention strategy will be maintained at a very high level and dramatically higher than now. You can, the, the principles of the bill are intact. It's the biggest increase in police in the history of the country. It's the toughest increase in punishment in the history of the country. It's the biggest increase in prevention programs in the history of the country. I'm not a member of the Congress. They have to work out all the details. If they produced this bill out of the conference, I would have happily supported this as I did the other one. Were you just getting into politics then by accepting the original bill? Now, that's one of those questions designed to spoil your birthday. <laughs> Because, because it's, it's something else, it's designed to confuse the American people about what really goes on up here. The president is not a member of the Congress. The Congress made a decision that they had a bill that they all wanted. They accommodated the interests as best they could. It met all my fundamental criteria. Assault weapons ban, ban on handgun ownership by kids, tougher penalties, longer imprisonment, more prevention. So does this bill. This bill has the added virtue 
of being able to be fully funded in the trust fund that we are creating by reducing the federal government to its lowest size in 30 years. And if in fact, let me just say, Rita, if in fact there has been no conference, if in fact the conference proceeds along the lines that I generally believe it's going on, and it has the added virtue of some strengthening of the language which was put in involving this old sexual predator issue. Uh, so in that sense, I think it is uh, a fine bill. It meets all the criteria. And it doesn't just gut the prevention programs, which I was determined to see not happen. Yes, well, Mr. President.